Welcome back to another episode of Control Alt Career, a podcast where we share stories of people who have taken a leap and embarked on an alternative career path in Asia. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and today I'm very happy to have Adrian join us. Adrian is the founder of Liquify, a technology platform that uses blockchain to tokenize illiquid assets such as real estate and mutual funds. Outside of Liquify, he is also an angel investor in fintech startups. But before starting Liquify, Adrian worked at BlackRock as an ESG analyst, where he worked with chairman and board members of listed companies in Asia on issues such as corporate governance, corporate actions, cybersecurity, and climate change. Thanks so much, Adrian, for your time and for joining me today. Thanks, Jennifer, for the invitation. And great to see you again. Yeah, good to have you here. So first question, I think the whole blockchain tokenization, these are all very buzzy words that are very trending right now. It's also quite new concepts that people may not really understand. Words. So maybe in define tokenization. So tokenization is, is broadly defined as a term to cut a liquid asset into smaller pieces. So normal investors instead of just institutions or family office could also buy in some of the illiquid asset. So whether you mention real estate, whether it is uh, some of the private equities, you can now buy 1% instead of a whole chunk of that with a lockup as well. So all of this, obviously some of the benefit for, for a tokenization is you could potentially enjoy liquidity to sell that particular fractional asset in a secondary market. So for example, if you're holding a real estate, usually it's held by a private company and then in a traditional sense, when there's a transfer of interest in that private company, you will require lawyers or co company registries to help you transfer interest. So basically, there's a lot of paperwork required. But now with blockchain, we are digitizing the register member. So meaning that you put the, those paper copy on the blockchain and you could automate some of the uh, actions with smart contracts. So some people will ask, so why you shouldn't use cloud, you shouldn't use Excel, but preferable you should use blockchain because blockchain is an immutable ledger. So meaning that any sensitive data, in, in this case, registered member, they are sensitive data that you should put on blockchain in case someone try to hack it or someone try to change any information of the ownership. Okay, so if I may try to summarize what you, you said, basically for illiquid assets, if you want to own a fraction, so for example, like to buy an apartment complex costs millions of dollars. And as an individual, you probably don't have millions of dollars to invest. And so you would might want to own a fraction of this apartment building and maybe just put in like $100,000, for example. But in order for you to do fractional ownership, you need to be able to figure out who owns what. And there's a lot of paperwork behind the scenes. And in order to trade or to get out of those positions when you want to sell your ownership of that apartment building, you use the blockchain to be able to... Recording the change. To record the change, exactly. Yeah. So you use the blockchain technology to be able to record that change. And because yeah. the blockchain is unchangeable, then people have faith in the system and they trust that the blockchain is able to help them securely transfer their assets. Yeah. So especially about your last sentence, blockchain, we usually describe it as a trustless technology, meaning that uh, you could trust the technology instead of a person. Uh, and that's also why people say blockchain could disintermediate a lot of banks or government. So trustless technology in, in this case to, to replace some of the third parties who handle the paperwork or like lawyers. Okay. So I guess back to liquefy, what do you guys do. So what Liquify does is basically we provide the technology suite to all the companies who want to do tokenization. So basically, if you are a traditional corporate, you want to approach this, but then you have no idea around technologies. So we basically provide all the consulting and, and the technology implementation with our software for them. But at the same time, when we evolve along the way over the past two years, we are migrating into new areas as well. So for example, actually just last week, we are, have approved uh, a license in UAE for us to distribute tokenized securities in a digital platform. So meaning that we could be a broker dealer in this space, selling the fractional asset directly online. 
So that is a, a, a big milestone for Liquify because we are slowly merging from purely a, a tech player into a real fintech player. Congratulations for getting that Thank license. You. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, I know we started with explaining pretty complicated concepts, but maybe just backtracking a little bit to how you actually got started. I met you when we were both at BlackRock. And you left after working there and decided to start your own company. I would really love to hear a little bit more about your thinking at that period of time. You know, when you were at BlackRock, were you already exploring the fintech space? And how did you land on the idea to start this business? Well, I actually, when I graduated, I already want to be an entrepreneur. And I haven't told BlackRock about that. But <laughs> it's always my dream to, to be an entrepreneur, but I knew that being an entrepreneur requires certain working experience with, with people or with institutions, especially in the financial space, right? Because even though I want to be an entrepreneur, I think some sort of uh, things related to finance will be more, makes more, more sense for me. It was a very structured program uh, for me and and there's quite a lot of exposure, to be honest, whether it is, whether it's, uh, you, you want to work in other office, whether you want to uh, have different teams exposure. And that's actually helped shape my career and, and personality a bit when I, when I wanted to become an entrepreneur, which is always my goal. So the, the moment that I decided to really pull a trigger to be an entrepreneur, it was when I was in the ESG team. There was one occasion that we were having an Australian bank being hacked for ATMs, and I was talking to that particular Australian bank uh, board on, on how you could have done better cybersecurity uh, measures. And, and I realized no one's on the board really cares about cybersecurity and all the experience were really pretty traditional. That's uh, the moment I thought that I, I, I gotta start up something myself because there's a opportunity. Especially I have been looking at the blockchain for quite a while and I knew that banks or asset managers or any institutions were not ready to look into the technologies. And, and, and I myself think that it was an arbitrage. For me as a young guy, only thing I had is being energetic so I could work 24 seven to start something faster than people do. So that's the reason I, I left because I, I feel that similar to internet is the time for opportunities. Once you decided on the idea you do something in like the cybersecurity space and, and relating to fintech. How did you go about starting? Well, it was tough, honestly, when you start a company because I was very used to uh, a corporate world. I think my first step there is actually spending like eight months to structure the business model, which is quite slow, to be honest. I think it's not that effective. But then I was uh, together with my co-founder who actually work at uh, HSBC Trading Floor um, and tough hours. We spent eight months of time at night to discuss around business case applications in, in this space. And as you know, you as a corporate person, you are pretty reserved and you always want to say, I want to go to this prospect client and to verify this idea. I want to validate this and that. So we spent eight months and then we consult lawyers, especially we are in the fintech space, uh, everything we do related to regulations. So lawyers, structuring a business idea. The first thing which I think which is the most important thing is, is to find the talents. So even though we have the uh, co-founder and, and a lot of people think that you could just uh, create a product or, or a business out of two people, but that's right. But you, we also have to identify the potential talents that we want to have when we scale the company. So I mentioned about lawyers, business model, talents, and I think ultimate thing is we find investors. The seed investors who just are not providing cash, but also believing in our idea. I think that matters, and, and that matters a lot throughout the two years with the seed investor. So with those four things in place, we pull a trigger and, and just both of us quit and start a company. If I look back at, at what I did, will I be different? I think I won't be, won't be different. I don't think anyone should risk a lot for a black rock career because <laughs> it's, it's a nice company so you basically have to spend quite a bit of time to think about that <laughs> i think same for you as well <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly black rock was honestly a a, a pretty good uh, career path and quite a prestigious job that a lot of people want so definitely <clears throat> 
did require a lot of thinking before before leaving leaving the job. Yeah. But I, I want to know a bit more in detail about you know the year 2017 for you. So like from January to October, you went out and found investors. You developed a business plan. Maybe tell me a bit more in depth about all, all, all of that. Like how did you find yeah. your co-founder? How did you come up with a business plan? And how did you find investors? Yeah. So starting with the business plan, I think we were quite old school. So we we look at the business first of all from a user perspective with real estate developers. So we think from a real estate developers, uh, what do they need from a technology perspective? What do they need from a business perspective? And then we wrote a white paper, literally just a 10 to 12 pages listing out our business model and, and what our technology offerings. And then we revise the white paper for 10, 12 times based on what we see in the market and what we hear from, from our friends or prospect clients. White paper presentation that we started pitch to pretend that we already working as a full-time pitch with some of them. Act like we could trigger that any day and, and talk to some of our friends, ask them to be a prospect clients. And, and they actually work in the real estate sector as well, so ask for feedback. In terms of finding talents, that's a very tricky part for every startup as well. I think most of the uh, talents in, in Hong Kong, to be honest, they, they want to join banks at financial industries, you know, either they're lawyers, uh, professionals. So to attract talents, I actually try to build my own profile in the fintech space. So I start to, I can't say leverage on BlackRock's name, but I can start to use more opportunities to talk more in public seminars. I was leading the one of the more fintech related association in Hong Kong at that time. So I try to grab those opportunities and to start talking from a more practitioner perspective in the asset management space. So with that, that actually attract quite a bit of young people reaching out because I, I guess everyone, even for those who join banks, bottom at, at, of the heart, they want to be an entrepreneur for some of the young people. So they just need someone closer to their age to tell them that it's actually possible. Something like you are doing with this podcast. So that is also a way to attract talents for me. It was a fortunate time for me as well because at that time, it's not a lot of uh, traditional finance guys went to blockchain space. So I was one of the first few in Hong Kong. So that helped me build my personal exposure as well as attracting talents. Then if you, if you talk about lawyers, uh, lawyers can suck up all your capital for any startup. So my brother is a lawyer, it's fortunate, but I can't ask close relative for a personal opinion in, in, in our company. So I, I just can just ask for introductions. I think that matters in startup, whatever, whether it's lawyer, whether it's BD, whether it's what, what kind of uh, advice, you, you should always ask for introductions. And obviously, uh, network's important in, in startup space. I think the toughest part between January and October is actually how I interacted with my co-founder. So you, as you knew, most of the startups failed. It's not about the product or the business. I think most of the ideas will be legit. And, and most of them failed because founders have this build or shareholders, investors have this build. And even though I was super close to my co-founder, we actually knew each other for like 10 to 12 years. I knew him when I was in college. But then when you start to work together, it's very different. So it's also not the best case when you work with your close friend. <laughs> so we spend time to figure out the working pattern and that 10 months actually matters. So, so re to repeat, I think even if I reinitiate that process in 2017, I might just spend probably longer time, 10 to 12 months time to, to do that. Obviously that would depend on the market as well. So if you think that opportunity is really you have to be faster than people for like a year, two years, because you think that's the moment. You, you probably do these things in parallel with launching a company. For me, I was just risk averse. Which I, I completely understand because I'm also very risk averse. <laughs> but I, I'm also curious to know, when did you feel was the right time? Like, what was the trigger to be like, okay, I'm ready to quit? The trigger was we did quite a lot of presentation to prospect clients or investors. And there was moment that we were quite sad that people didn't understand about our idea. Then we figure out that it's not their issues, it's our issues, right? The way that we present it, the way probably the product doesn't match what they want and, and investors and clients are always right. The moment that I really wanted to leave the company is 
we change a lot on the business model and we change the way we present and until one point that we received really good feedback from investors and clients and at one point one investor just listened to our business for one minute and he handed out a check for half a million dollars so that was the moment that we feel this besides cash because initially we didn't prepare to raise a seed round so we want to use our own capital anyway for a for startup company but that was a very encouraging moment and i still remember till now that was so shocked but some people just if they believe in you i think that along the way of your career they, they would just invest in you so uh, that was the moment got it so i guess for you it was when someone really believed in decided to invest in your idea that you thought okay i can uh, quit my job now but yeah. if you weren't planning on taking a seed round i guess a bit more sensitive but was salary a concern for you before you decided to quit your job? Well, that is not sensitive. That's a very sensible question. I, I wouldn't tell you no. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, especially in Hong Kong, right? You have to buy the flat. You have to spend so much every day. But then the fact is, even when we raised the money, we start off with 15k Hong Kong D as salary initially when we start a company and that is not enough but then that's fine because you, you at least need to have some cash so I wouldn't say you shouldn't be receiving salary that's that's just undoable in Hong Kong <laughs> but when I haven't got a seat round and we, when we haven't thought about getting a seat round we were ready to be all in and uh, we had the timeline for say if we can get traction within three years we just have to drop the idea and it's very rational uh, conversation we have with my faculty founder. So when a seat round came in, I was excited. People believe in that, my idea, but it's, I was also quite stressful because once you are using investors' proceeds to pay yourself salary, you have a milestone to meet every month. You can't just pay, even if it's 15K, it's, it's investors' money. So happy, but also at the same time nervous. Going back a little bit, how did you find these investors to begin with? And how did you get involved in like the real estate? Because you mentioned that you had a lot of real estate companies that were your clients that you kind of pitched to at the beginning. How did you yeah. find these people? If I look back, I think most of the times it's about luck, honestly. But then luck is not pure luck. You, you need the opportunity to generate that luck. For my investors, I went to a blockchain conference and I was so desperate. I was meeting people everywhere at the conferences. At one point, I, I just holding the paper copy presentation deck and when there, whenever there's chance, I talk to people. And I met with a gatekeeper of a family office who got so interested in blockchain. And there was the opportunity and I asked for a referral to a direct family. And I tried to make sure I prepare for the best. And I sell him the dream. I think it is honestly, they invested mostly because of my passion. <laughs> I wouldn't say they 100% understood about capital market, how it could be reformed, how it could revolutionize it. Because when you heard about the concept, it's quite difficult. So I think it's more about passion. But if you're asking about real estate developers and clients, I think the same thing that sometimes you just have to go out there to meet with everyone. And, and even though you don't have the opportunity right at that moment, I think things will link up at the end. So I think what I learned throughout the past years, I think ultimately people will help you if you treasure relationship. People take it in heart when you when you uh, help them when they need the help. Even if it's minor help, introducing a person, even if it's just giving opinions or, on something. And sometimes you need several of that those people in, in your career. Just several of them will be fine. So I think that helps. The real estate developers ultimately connect us to multiple of them. We build a reputation in, in the market. So even though I was not with a real estate background, ultimately we were able to corner quite a market share in, in the real estate market. That's super interesting and it really speaks to the power of relationships. Okay, so once you decided to quit, how did you grow and expand your business? Initially, we were very scared of using capital because it's investors' money and we were very risk, risk averse, you know, cutting this cost and that cost. But then I, I think to one point we realized that we have to use capital to grow whether it's to hire the right talents, whether it is sometimes and very reluctantly is to sponsor some events. It's very uh, unusual for startups because startups always take care of the capital quite cautiously. But then 
there was an event that we actually co-organized with Bloomberg. That was a changing point for our growth of the company. We spent quite a bit of money, to be honest. I think it is 100K, 200K US dollar. We realized it's different when you are host compared to a sponsor. So we were thinking, we sponsor 50K for conferences, you spend 200K to sponsor four of them. Why don't we just host one with a reputable company? And it's a big bet. But then since then, we have very quickly scale up our brand and, and product offerings in the market. So people heard about us, you know, they, when you could organize something with, with a huge company, they will put you in the same category. So uh, help us to track clients, uh, have a lot of inbound queries, uh, a lot of talents who want to join a company. And if you ask me if it's right or not, I, I don't think it applies to every company because it's a bet on uh, a single event. But I think that matters a lot to us looking back at the track, track record. Uh, and then it comes to a time that it was super fast growing for our first 10 months. Obviously, you, you get clients and you build a product, you attraction, people heard about you in the market, tons of reasons want to talk to you. But then when you pass that time, like 10 to 12 months, it's really about organic traction. So you, you do less marketing, you do uh, uh, re really more focus on a product, improving a product. So we kind of tamed down a bit in, in I think, between... 10 to 16 months. So we kind of tamed down a bit, focus on the product, focus on the talents, a lot of issues to solve internally as a company, a lot of arguments among founders. <laughs> then after 16 months, we improve on the product. We actually reinitiate our expansion, but this time is more thinking about geographical expansion. So it's also about uh, resources allocation. So for example, our tech team was in uh, Hong Kong before, and can we find the better talent to cheaper price in China, for example. And we actually managed to do that. We start with hiring people in, in Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Then we also moved to uh, some of resources because of opportunities in Dubai. We're quite famous for that because we have a joint venture with the royal family in Dubai, which which is interesting opportunity. But uh, And it was a it was a story as well. So we received an email from the royal family when, at one point. I know, Obviously, I read that email, it's a scam. When you receive someone <laughs> saying he's the sheik in, in Dubai and, and he owns the Emirate group and the, you know, the, uh, owns the airline and stuff, and obviously it's a, it's a scam. <laughs> and I, 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 it was funny because I, I recall a few days later, my, my COO was talking to me, hey, I received this email and I think it's a scam. And I told him I received this email as well. And then we were saying, why don't we prank the guy a bit? And then we have the call with the Dubai side. And it's so strange. It was so official. It was so polite. It doesn't sound like a scam. <laughs> and I, I remember, but, but turns out is, we say at the end of the call, it might be 1% chance it's real. <laughs> then we do some research online and realize that actually they care about technology advancement and they did actually some sort of collaboration with other companies and we say hey why don't we fly to Dubai check it out we see a real person <laughs> so I remember it was in June time and uh, COO and I go to Dubai we see the sheik in the <laughs> private office and we actually trigger a deal in July so they were very impressed with us we trigger a deal and we set up everything in a month so that was a fun story, but also obviously and, and a story for people not to treat every email scam. That is hilarious. I guess good thing you decided to prank them back. Otherwise you would have potentially yeah. missed out on like a big yeah. investor. <laughs> so, so after Dubai, uh, we kind of go back to normal as well. We focus on the client journey. So the first phase, high growth phase, and then focus on the product, focus on geographical expansion. And then is because we have a number of clients, we had to focus on the client support. Uh, customer journey so that's when the time that we hire more uh, business managers supporting cars for a company one of the key questions that a lot of people have is when you first start out a company do you need to have a cto and how do you go about finding a cto and hiring engineers yeah uh, that's tough <laughs> even now we are looking for technology people we use e-financial career we use headhunters and it's very difficult so when we start the company, I was able to meet our current CTO at events. I think the, the thing for CTO 
And when people start a company, they always confuse that you need a CTO super good at coding. It's actually not, because CTO is a manager. You have the leverage on him to hire the best tech team. So you probably have the best coder, best back end front end, but then CTO himself has to be a people person. So my gut feeling is uh, if you ask the CTO to code, they suck. Actually, they haven't code for quite a while. <laughs> and, and so it's actually finding a person probably at events or by introductions who see the vision of your company, not just not purely an engineer and also able to articulate from a product perspective to a technology perspective. And that's very important. So if I could lay out what I want for a product, he can lay out what's the limitation from a technology perspective. So I was lucky to find uh, our CTO and who then I managed our hiring in, in tech team. But then my co-founder as well has a coding background. So he was a quantitative finance but computer science degree guy as well. So he was able to, before finding a CTO, to manage some sort of coding and, and a product perspective. So it sounds like actually you made a lot of connections or built a lot of your network by going to events. Is that one way that you would recommend people do if they're thinking about starting a business? Yes, I, I think you, you need to plan out your roles in these events. So initially, when you have no connections, you go to events as much as possible and try to meet with people and then you start to think about what's the next step for me it was trying to organize one small scale myself so join some sort of committees or less official fintech events a committee event and then to organize events yourself it was also when you organize events either you are just a panelist either you are just a helper and you start to scale up your role in the events and at one point you know, there's those kind of events, right? They have a private room for just investors and clients, right? It's, it's super uh, a close circle of people. You just have to get in that room. <laughs> so a right, helper for handing water <laughs> to those people, you get in that room and start talking to those people and, and to make those connections instead of just being an audience for those events. So I think you could figure out a way uh, when you get to multiple events and then start to scale back in number of events that you attend and focus on the best qualities events are organized by the best uh, committees and now i will just based on experience go to those events organized by the best organizers um, uh, instead of tons of other opportunities you just have to ultimately brand yourself as a selected person <laughs> basically <laughs> and i think yeah personal branding was something you spoke a lot about too, too. like you, you building your own personal brand to be able to hire other talents and to get customers. And I think that's also another key thing I picked up from this conversation. Shifting to something a bit more personal, if you could go back in time, is there anything you would have redone? Something that I would do better is probably be tougher to choose or hire people. So a lot of times startups, like uh, I should just hire people and, and haven't thought about what we would do next. So sometimes I find uh, resources being mismatched for a company. So for example, if our focus, uh, these two months have to be on legal side, we actually uh, haven't got that talent here, but, but instead we have a bunch of product person. So fun, something I would do better is probably have that coordinate better with my COO. Um, so internal communication being done much better is something that I would do. Because usually when you're in startup, you're always working long hours every day. You just miss out the time to communicate. And sometimes you just need a coffee to talk casually on, on update and stuff. And I figure it out uh, probably 12, 12 months later, I opened the, I started my company and then it got better. It got better, but can be better. Yeah, I think people management is one yeah. of the key things that, that came up with my prior conversation with the founders of Style Theory as well. I think that's something that's de definitely difficult. And so one last question for you. I wanted to ask your thoughts on this statement. In the Western world, there's this saying that follow your dreams and then the money will come. Whereas I think in Asia, it's much more about financial security. Would love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Well, uh, that that is... Because in, in Western world, the culture is you can live with a very simple life as well. And obviously, real estate is not that expensive. Even it's expensive in the US, it's, it's not comparable to Hong Kong. So that's why I always think that it's understandable. I wouldn't say it's right for Asians to have that mentality. But I would say it depends on 
which stage of career you were in. And for someone like us, uh, very young, I'm not saying that you should try whatever being all in, you should set up your milestone and the deadline for yourself. But I, in generally before 45, I think you should try all different things because you, you'll be regret some point in your life. And, and the trial different things, well, I believe ultimately money will come, come in. I, I believe that because if you're fixing a right problem, there's a revenue. I think it is actually quite bad to think about financial first and then to chase a dream. Because actually when I graduated, I, I was choosing between a BlackRock and an IBD role. The IBD role obviously pay much better, but I was also thinking it's, it's, you don't have time. So basically every IBD person I know told me that they want to be an entrepreneur. And 10 years later, guess what? They're still in IBD. <laughs> <laughs> so I think as a young person, uh, if you could sustain your life, obviously different persons have different backgrounds. Some of them just need the money and, and it's understandable because the family probably need the support. And, but I think you could always squeeze out time to try or something. Whether it's, it, it not necessarily have to be starting a company that extreme. You could just be doing some sort of, you know, learning off, off work. You could be reading books and to plan out your journey. I think it's about the mentality to get planned for a next step when it's for something that you like, instead of just, hey, I right away I have to start something myself. It all depends on multiple factors. For me, setting milestone, deadline, knowing what you want, and, and a lot of people trying to figure out what they want. I think that is a, a chicken and egg as well. If you don't try, you never can figure out what you want. Um, so that's a key question. People told me that they can't figure out what they want because they're always in the same position. Just try out different things. Even by reading a book, you kind of figure out something that you're interested in. I completely agree. I think a, a, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I want to do my own thing, but I have no idea what I would want to do. So I think that's really good advice to, you know, just explore. Even talk to people. Yeah, yeah like chatting. And I think that's also partly why I decided to start this podcast is just kind of give people exposure to different types of people so that that can kind of help them figure out what it is that they are interested in or might want to do in their life. Any advice before we close off the conversation? One advice is, because the old generation always told us not to be jumpy in a lot of different ways, right? You jump from one job to another. But, but my thinking is always jumpy is not always right. You can't do, I mean, you do six months in this job and switch to another is probably not good. But, but don't have the inertia as well the, for, for being in a negative position. So a lot of my friends or young people complain, what should I do? And, for the next three years, she's, she or she is in the same position. So I think inertia is much more dangerous than being jumpy. Mm -hmm. Being jumpy, in, in a good way, you recognize that you probably made a bad choice. Uh, in a bad way, you probably don't know what you want because so you're being jumpy. But at least you are in the process to find something you want, even though you're jumpy. But if you have a inertia in the positions that you don't want, you're wasting time yourself. And I think one thing that I probably proud of myself is I always know what I want, even when I was in BlackRock. And thinking about what you want is not always about the role, it's broader about what you want in your life and how you, and your vision in your life, what you want to achieve and what you want to do to accomplish that. I think, so my advice in, in short probably is don't be attached to inertia. Uh, I think whatever things in your life, especially in career, just don't get attached to that. I think that's a really great piece of advice. And I think that was something that I also struggled with because I stayed at BlackRock for so many years. So definitely I had that same inertia problem, but um, I, I totally know what you mean. Like a lot of um, people I know, they complain about their jobs for years and years and years, and yet they still keep staying at their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's a really good piece of advice to just, you know, do a bit of self-reflection and, and really have a think about whether or not this is something that you want to continue doing. So yeah, I just wanted to thank you for your time. This has been really great chatting with you. I learned a lot about both blockchain technology, tokenization, but also just about your personal story. And it's been really cool to see how far you've come since the day was when we were working together at BlackRock. So thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. I hope this is useful. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. And there I'm with the founder of Liquify. Takeaways that I got from this conversation. One, looking to attract, build up your own, build up your own personal brand, speaking in panels and building 
and apply an expert in to financial products. Two, to grow and market, Adrian very quickly built by co-host. Don't look for the best coder. It's supposed to be a people. Three, chief technology officer, best coder. Be a people's person and will help engineers to your mission. Four, want to start your job but not sure what you would want. Start with something small, like reading. And from my perspective, what I stood in was what helped me figure out what and from me figure out what I was interested in. paying attention what else would I rather be? and that's it for tuning in thanks for tuning in to another career check this episode where I'll be interviewing a girl from Hong Kong who started a company in if you think pursuing an alternative try telling your parents the idea to just how she did it it's a yes. yeah do hit subscribe and this will help the algorithm and if you haven't for this week